And that's one of the reasons I'm a Christian, because mathematics works. And atheism gives me no explanation of why mathematics works. But the great scientists, Newton I've named, Kepler, Galileo, Clark Maxwell, Faraday, all of them were believers in God. One of the things that was so important to me as a brand new believer was to be able to reconcile seemingly opposing ideas or disciplines like math and science, which I've always loved in school, and then this idea of faith and believing in things like a virgin giving birth and the resurrection of a man from the dead. And listening and learning from people like you has been so helpful to me. Uh, so here you are at Oxford and you're debating notable atheists, you're teaching on math and on science, and yet you are a man of faith, debating people like Christopher Hitchens, uh, who's wonderful to listen to, and, and Richard Dawkins, who's challenging to so many of us. Uh, have you always had a love for math and science, uh, or is that something that, that developed later in your life? No, it developed very early on. I was quite good at arithmetic at school. And that then led to an interest in mathematics. It also led to an interest in languages. I love languages. And I've kept that going. But right early on, my parents, who were wonderful in encouraging me to think about the big questions. So I wanted to know where mathematics fitted in science and where science fitted into the big picture. And I was a teenager at the time when I discovered that it was quite clear that science didn't give us a full picture. It can't explain everything. And I started voraciously reading and thinking and studying, and particularly C.S. Lewis, who I lived to hear in 1962 in his last lectures, was a tremendous help to me in showing how logical Christianity was, just as logical as the mathematics that I loved. For some people, um, studying mathematics is worse than eating broccoli. And yet you <laughs> say that you love to study math. What, what is it about mathematics that's interesting? Well, I love broccoli too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the fascination is you here have a very highly compressed language. And we discover that in some mysterious almost way that it tells us something about the universe. We can reduce some of the things going on out there in the universe to mathematics. And we think of Isaac Newton and his gravitational equation or Kepler's laws or the Clark Maxwell's laws of uh, electromagnetism. And that always fascinated me, that in a few symbols, you could capture something which when you unfolded it, gave you, for instance, if you take Newton's equation, gravitation equation, you can very rapidly see that the planets move in ellipses around the sun as focus. And that kind of thing absolutely riveted me. Of course, it all depends, I think, at school time of having a really inspirational teacher, which I was very fortunate to have. So I love mathematics. But you see, the, the fascinating thing is Einstein once said, the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And he put his finger in something very important. And that's one of the reasons I'm a Christian, because mathematics works. And atheism gives me no explanation of why mathematics works. But the great scientists, Newton I've named, Kepler, Galileo, Clark Maxwell, Faraday, all of them were believers in God. And I think the best way to sum that up is in the words of C.S. Lewis. He once said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in the lawgiver. So there's an intimate connection with the biblical worldview and the rise of modern science. I often say to people, Kurt, that I'm not remotely ashamed of being a scientist and a believer in God because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. 
I, I love that. And, I, and you mentioned earlier that your parents encouraged you to uh, read on a wide variety of subjects and from a, a variety of authors, not just a Christian worldview, but others as well. Uh, do you recommend that for parents today? Because there's certainly things that they could be reading that would undermine a biblical worldview. We need, as parents, particularly Christian parents, to prepare our children for going out into college and university. And I know the statistics in some countries are horrifying, that over 70% of, of kids who profess Christianity at school, within two or three years of university, they've lost it. And I think one of the main reasons for that is that the parents are not spending time answering their questions, or if they can't answer them, which is often the case, feeding them with really good information, which is available today in a measure that it wasn't available when I was younger, and helping them to think through these worldview issues. You cannot live in a pluralistic, complex, multicultural world and stand as a Christian without facing questions, and you need to be ready to answer them and defend the Christian gospel. And that's what I try to spend most of my life doing. As a mathematician, John, when you look at the universe, what are some of the evidences that point you to believe that it was created by God? Well, the very first thing it might surprise some people. It's the very fact that we can do science with mathematics. In other words, we discovered that this is what I call a word-based universe. It's describable in a language. And that resonates wonderfully with two things, two central statements in the biblical text. Firstly, the first words of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. And then a bit later on, all things came to be through the word. And there is John explaining how the universe came to exist. It is word based. It was spoken by God, who is the word. And in the simpler language of Genesis, but no less profound, you have the constant repetition and God said, and God said. So one of the things that points me towards God is the semiotic nature of mathematics. It describes the universe in language. And another thing that fits beautifully in with that was discovered relatively recently, and that is the fact that the human genome is the longest word, contains the longest word we've ever discovered, 3.4 billion chemical letters all arranged in a row. And when Francis Collins stood beside the President of the United States and announced that they decoded it, they said, this is the language of God. And there in our genetics, in every one of the 10 trillion cells in our bodies, is a lengthy word. And that, to my mind, speaks directly of an intelligent input from a speaking God. It's a word-based universe. So that's where I would start. And then I would pick up probably from physics the fact that's recognized by virtually all physicists and cosmologists that this universe is incredibly fine-tuned to have carbon-based life on it. The basic constants of nature are so precise, have to be so precise, otherwise the universe wouldn't exist. And again, that demands explanation. Every scientist sees that it demands an explanation. But people like the late Stephen Hawking, who was a genius and was in Cambridge around the same time as I was there, they reject, of course, the God explanation, but they come to believe in a universe that created itself from nothing, which to my mind is logically absurd apart from anything else. John, uh, I, I'm so glad you're not recommending that people stay away from the tough questions, but you are inviting them into those difficult questions and to explore those things. And, and that's what I want for my children. And, and I love that, that you see studying math almost as a way, a form of worshiping God. I, explain what you mean by that. Uh, we think of singing as worship or reading the scriptures, but studying mathematics? In, in what way does that send us into worship? Well, not quite in the same way. I think if we're singing really good music, you're actually verbalizing things about God. 
And that is very important because as I understand worship in its narrow sense at least, it is a response to God speaking. And it's our articulating what we think about God and believe about him. Just to give you a crude analogy, if you want to get people to laugh, you have to tell them a joke. You don't discuss the mechanics of laughter. And if you want to get people to worship, you tell them about God. You don't discuss emotion or anything like that. And therefore, it seems to me the primary source of worship is God speaking to us through his word. But mathematics and the study of nature in general, the heavens declare the glory of God, not only visually, but mathematically. And there's a, there's an absolute beauty in some of the mathematics that, that we study. And it certainly fits perfectly in with the idea that whatever we do, whether it's mathematics or expounding scripture, both of which I like doing, we do all to the glory of God. It's not restricted to what happens inside a church building. Thanks for watching my interview with John Lennox about God, science, and mathematics. For more conversations about issues impacting our world, like and subscribe to our channel. I'll see you in the next video.